All right. Any questions? Homework day, is it? Yeah? yeah. All right. Those go okay? Yeah. All right. Well, on the way out, I don't need them now. I'm not going to grade them now. Um, now we, today we really bring together uh, some of the stuff, some of the stuff we did a lot in statics. In fact, uh, it's, it's important enough what we did in statics, we're going to spend a couple days reviewing here. Um, we're going to start looking at bending. Uh, most of it's going to be based around simple beam design. And we spent a lot of time last fall looking at beams in some kind of transverse loading where it might be uniform loading, might be point loading of some kind. Uh, we even had cases where uh, there was uh, some kind of moment required as it would have been the case in some kind of uh, cantilevered beam like that. All of those type of things. Well, and then there, there might even be the type of thing where we had some kind of load that would contribute in a transverse fashion in that there's a uh, horizontal load there. But now we also uh, might have axial loading. We didn't really look at that kind of loading much, if at all, in, in uh, um, statics last fall. Well, we did. We did have axial loading when we had two force members. Remember, two force members could only be in axial <coughs> loading. But we didn't have to often put the entire, uh, an entire beam itself in some kind of axial loading. Um, but we, we can and will hear because we certainly looked at the stresses call caused by that type of loading. In fact, that's how we opened this course. The very first thing we looked at the very first day, I think, was uh, axial loading uh, that contributed to normal stress. So we're gonna look at this kind of thing a lot. Um, we'll, we'll open with just the normal type of things we did before. Remember we had uh, simple supports that we could statically solve for and then uh, we put some kind of loading on there. Um, we'll continue to do that type of thing now. But as we've seen already, we can also look at statically indeterminate type loading, the simplest being a beam that is pinned at both supports rather than the usual we had last fall where we had a pin and a roller support because we couldn't solve statically for any type of loading that we might have had that would uh, require more than three reactions on a two-dimensional problem. In statics, we only had <coughs> three equations that we could use on our two-dimensional problems. The three equations being, of course, some of the forces in the x and the y direction, zero, and then the sum of the moments in the plane we are looking at were zero. So uh, we're going to have to add to that as need be as we start to look at the real reaction of these beams, we'll very quickly here get to the, the point that these beams will undergo some kind of deformation. This one might do something like that because of the, the loading. Uh, we're going to use that kind of thing just like we did for our statically indeterminate beams. Actually, this one would probably go up a little bit, down a little bit, something like that. We're going to actually be able to calculate these, these deformations from the neutral position at various places 
and use that kind of thing to solve statically indeterminate problems that we couldn't before. A little bit before we get to that, we are going to look at what kind of cross-sectional shapes we can use, whether they're I-beams or built-up beams, which are the type of things you might do if you're using uh, lumber to put some pieces together. All kinds of different things or possibilities that we'll be able to look at. We're also going to look at what happens at these joints that we have to either nail and or glue together where these beams are attached to each other. None of that kind of stuff did we look at in statics. We didn't look at the cross-sectional shapes. We didn't look at the cross-sectional areas. We didn't look at the deflection of any of these beams and what these shapes and areas have to do to, to the resistance of these uh, materials to severe deflection. Uh, some deflection is uh, just one of the facts of life, like friction is. But we don't have to undergo severe deflections, even to the point where uh, you could consider this to be failure of the beam. All right, so that's where we're going now. To get us there first, we're going to have to do a little uh, intense review. In fact, I think it's important enough, I believe, I've, I've uh, set aside two days for this as we're going to revisit shear and moment diagrams. You guys, Bobby, you look forward to that? Like those? Uh, you guys seem to have it pretty good last fall. I don't remember the feeling going through the statics class that a group had it as, as good as you guys seem to, but uh, we got some newbies here. They're barely awake. Frank, you okay? No. Um, so we're going to uh, we're going to revisit that. It's an application of only our statics equations, but it's going to lead us to the ability to design the beam cross sections and look at. Uh, the influence of these forces on the material themselves. So, to start with, we'll uh, we'll just do a little problem here. So, we've got a beam that's got a pin support there, roller support there, and has two loads on it, two point loads. 20 kilonewtons there, 40 kilonewtons there. These are typically gravitational loads, something set on that beam, whether it's a wall uh, that's holding a floor up above and that's why it looks like a point load, uh, all kinds of things are possibilities. So 2.5 meters of that end overhangs. Then we have three meters from that support to the load, and then another two meters out to the end. So, um, remember what we're trying to do with the shear moment diagrams is look at the internal forces in the material itself. The shear moment diagrams is a graphical display of that and it allows us to determine what the internal forces are so that very shortly here, uh, next week, we'll get to it. We'll start designing the cross sections that can withstand those material, those internal forces with particular uh, loads of some kind. So if you remember, one of the first things we need to do is determine what the reactions are. This is a statically determinant beam, so we can determine plainly using our statics equations the reactions of those two supports. So do that real quick as, as kind of a warm up for both the day and the semester since we haven't done too many of those kind of things in a while, but we've got to have those right, otherwise we don't have the uh, 
uh, internal forces, right, that come right after this. So we're looking for the two reaction forces. Might not be up, but uh, certainly it looks like we'd expect that to be the case. However, we don't know how much. So, take a second to come up with that. Some of the force is going to be nothing more than the two add together to equal 60, but you got to figure out how much of each one goes on uh, each reaction. And uh, so we're going to need to sum the moments about some point, determine what V and D are.
clockwise moments equal all the counterclockwise moments. Pat, where are you? Did you agree on anybody? Yep, we all agree. Were you, were you, were you looking for some? Oh yeah, there's nothing guy in there. There is? Yeah. Are you serious? For sure, you should go check it out. Well, not long. <laughs> So we passed out. Do I need to call security or no. health and safety? I'm sure he's fine. Because <laughs> you kicked him and he moved? No. That's not me. Not fast. <laughs> now he's going to come looking for those who are going to be in trouble. <laughs> DJ, caught your mistake? Yes. <laughs> Jake, caught your mistake? You agreed with them? Yep. Did you? Does he? He didn't check, did he? So you're lying to me in two things in one day. Usually my son only does one a day. All right, we got B, was, what, Jake? Oh, hold on. Oh, geez. 46 and 14, is that right? All right. From that, we need to draw the free, the, the shear moment diagram. I encourage you to do them straight up and down at each other. What we're going to need most is what is the maximum shear and what is the maximum moment and where they occur. Because we're going to start designing beams to withstand those internal forces of shear and moment. And we can selectively build up those beams. So we need to know where the moments and where the um, and where the where the beams are uh, most stressed, we can apply our strongest designs there to withstand that. So typically, let's review what these internal forces are. We imagine a, a cut through the material to expose those internal forces. And we need to do this anywhere in a section things haven't changed much. So we, uh, between A and B, nothing really changes. So we can put a cut anywhere in there. Some position X, and that will expose the shear that's going to be needed to withstand any forces on that section. And since those are separated by some distance X, there's a moment there we need to have some kind of other internal moment to resist that and we need to find out what it is. If you remember, we have a convention for our signs. Any shear on the right side that's up and any moment that's counterclockwise we call positive. Sorry, I got it wrong with the shear. Down on that side. Up on the other exposed side. So that's positive shear. That's positive moment. Any moment on the other side, that's up. Moment in the other way, that's positive. That's our convention for what we call positive and what we call negative. So we can see that the shear needs to balance that force. It's just a sum of the forces in the y direction. That's going to be negative for the convention we've chosen. So along some distance x and 
units of kilonewtons. Anywhere between A and B, the, the shear is a constant, and in this case, a minus 20. And we know that that's all the way out to, all the way out to point B. The moment itself is a factor of this x. because that comes from it, uh, the internal strength of the material itself to try to resist that moment that's increasing as we move along the beam because that x itself increases. And so at uh, this very end, x is zero, it increases from there. It's a negative moment in our convention. It's linear. So we know the moment to be something like that. To a maximum at point B, at least a maximum for what we've done so far, when we do the 20 kilonewtons at the distance 2.5, so, so far, our maximum is minus 50 kilonewton meters. That takes us out to B, where we have the reaction applied, and then nothing else happens beyond B, so we can go beyond there somewhere to put our cut That's what, 46 kilonewtons. And now we're again at some, some distance x beyond the 2.5, because we need to go past b, we've already done up to b, and before we get to c. Obviously, we've got to have some shear down to resist the uh, extra amount going up because of the support there. And it's got to be of uh, uh, 26 kilonewtons. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a simple force balance on that section. Remember, every portion of everything we look at is in static equilibrium. And then we need some kind of uh, some kind of moment here. Not sure which direction it would go until we calculate it. It's got to be enough there that it resists the moment of these two parts. So we can calculate the moment it needs to resist. Uh, it's got to be 46. kilonewtons that far away from that end. There's that moment caused by the support. That distance is x minus 2.5. And then it also needs to resist a moment in the opposite direction. A distance x away. Um, however, this is all our negative convention, so we really should have a negative sign in there. That we distribute through to get the right convention on that.
that's gonna, yeah, that'll do it for us. So minus 46 times minus 0.05 plus, nope, that's all we need, is a plus 115, is that right? And then a minus x, a minus 46x plus a 20x is a minus 26x. No, minus 14. Minus, yeah, minus 46 plus 20. Yeah, it's 26. Oh no, I had, uh, yeah, that's right. But that's not what I have here. What went different? Minus 40. Well, let's check it because we know that the moment must be continuous since there's no applied moment. So let's check this at x equals uh, 2.5. We should get the same moment we left off here, which was minus 50, do we? So 115 minus 26 times 2.5. Do that real quick. If we don't get the same minus 50, then we have a mistake. It is? Okay. So, uh, we can use that as a check simply because we know it must be continuous from here. So, this is positive? This comes out to be positive 50, so we, we have a minus sign error through there. So putting that in didn't work. Let's double check why. That's Should it be 2.5 minus x? 2.5. We need, the moment arm is this distance, which is x minus 2.5. Oh, we have it drawn in the right direction. So, yeah, so the moment's gonna become like, so should be 46x minus 20x. All right, so that gives us a minus 50, and that's what we wanted. We wanted the minus 50, plus we knew we wanted a positive slope. Then we can figure out at x equals 5.5, which takes us to c, and we have a linear slope in between there. So 5.5 times 26 minus 115 is 28, right? Yeah, that's what I got. So now we got everything. Okay, so we're from a minus 50 to a plus 28, somewhere in there. with a linear fit between because we know that to be uh, a straight line. Then we can do the last section We can do it from either end. Um, then we have the 40 kilonewtons down. 
now we've exposed a little bit of the beam past C between D. 60 down, 46 up, we got 14 up. That's a negative convention. Oh, we didn't draw in the shear here that we had, which was a plus 26. Now we're down at a minus 14. And that matches with the amount of support that comes up, brings us to, to zero at the end of the beam. And the moment required we can figure out the same way. You'll see it's linear. And we know there's no moment at the end because it's just a simple roller and there's no way it can support any moment. And it's got to come into the zero at the free end of the beam. Because that kind of support offers no moment support. So we must finish at zero at that end of the beam. Dick? Was that the rule with the no moments of the reactions? Is it just rollers? Or is it yeah, remember, remember we had a table in the statics book that showed what kind of support or what kind of reactions each support can give and the roller support and the pin support can offer no moment. Right. So that's why there was no change in the moment here at that reaction. And there, since this is at the end of the beam, it must finish at zero moment there. For some reason I just thought that B had to like go to zero for the moment. No, it doesn't say there is no moment in the beam there. There is bending in the beam there. However, it doesn't contribute any moment, which is why there's no change in the moment here. There's a change in the slope, but not a change in the moment. What we're looking at, and what we'll be able to see soon, is any place the beam would have curvature, there's going to be a moment in the material. So you can imagine that if it was loaded like this, it would curve something like that, probably. Anywhere there's a curve in the beam, there's internal moment. So you can see that the beam curves at B. It's pretty straight right here where it goes from one curvature to the other. And that's about where we have the, the zero moment. So now we would in fact know that right there, the slope of the beam is essentially linear as we go from one curvature in the beam to another curvature in the beam. That's the kind of thing we'll be able to look at now is what, what is the, the uh, beam's reaction now itself to the curvature in these beams. Don't forget that all of these three diagrams must agree with each other in terms of what the loads are and what they cause. What do? Like the shear and the moment diagrams each. What is the relationship like between the area, area and the shear? You take the area and then like the first shear. Yeah, uh, these like areas the these shear. areas have to do with each other, but no, these areas are not the same. <laughs> no, the area, area of the first shear is the same. Hang on. I got two ears. You take one, you take one. Go. Isn't it like if you take the area of the first section of the shear diagram, it tells you where the maximum moment is? Or well, it you where it goes. what is the relationship between the areas? And in fact, there's a relationship between the slopes as well. What is the relationship? Do you remember? The slope of the shear diagram, or the value of the shear diagram, is the slope of the moment diagram. Remember that? V equals dm dx. 
if we take that and make it v dx equals dm, and then integrate from uh, any one place x1 to any other place x2, and we integrate from m1 to m2, where m1 is the moment at x1, m2 is the moment at x2, this side is the area under the VX diagram, which is that little square there for this example. So it's minus 20 times 2.5 is a minus 50 is the area. Its units are kilonewtons times meters. So it has units of moment. That is equal to this other side which is the change in moment between x1 and x2. And that's exactly what we got. The change in moment between x1 and x2 is equal to that area, which is minus 50. So we have those two relationships between these two graphs. that the value of the shear at any point is equal to the slope of the moment diagram. The slope was minus 20 here, plus 50 there, minus uh, whatever that was, 14, I think. Yeah, minus 14 there. The shear was constant in those sections, so the slope is constant in those sections. And that's what we were getting right there. That's the slope of the, that's an equation of a straight line. And then also the area of the VX diagram equals the change in the moment between the same two spots that you use for the area. So the area of this middle section, what was that value? 26. Uh, 26. So 26 <coughs> times 3, 78. So the change in the moment is minus 50 to plus 28 is 78. And so all of these things agree. So remember those two very important relationships to always check this stuff. And then if you remember, we even have another one, so we'll get to that right now with another beam, which we can start right now, come up with the free, free bot, or the shear moment diagram. So we have a cantilever beam. That's one where one end is embedded in a wall. That means there is moment support as well as uh, vertical support there. Three foot, two foot, three foot. All right, so at the middle of the beam, we've got a uniform load there, as if uh, some material of some kind is stacked there, or maybe you expect a, even a human load to be there. And then, so that's uh, that's eight feet from the end of the beam to that point. And then there's three feet and there we've got some kind of arm there of some kind that's supporting its own load. Point load of 10 kips sometimes, so maybe there's a some kind of a motor running something there with this arm there, two feet. And then that's another three feet to the wall. Alright, got that? 
that picture. And we need to come up with a shear moment diagram for this more complex loading. Remember, you can do it from either end, but the relations are all the same. It doesn't matter. We're still looking for the internal resistance of the material to this loading. Kips. Moment will be in. Oh, I need to give you the flow distribution here. Three kips per foot. Do you put letters on there too? So when I put them on, you don't change them. Oh, yeah. If we need it. Uh, A, B, C, and B. A, B, C, and the wall is D. All right. Um, what about this load here on this bracket arm? What do we do about that? Look at that section. We've got that 10 kip load two feet out in that bracket arm. What does that mean to us in terms of the shear moment diagram? We can replace that with an equivalent load on the beam. As this 10 kips pushes down, that's going to cause this arm to push down as well with 10 kip. That vertical load, because of this arm, is going to be transferred over to that point, uh, that point C. However, because of this moment arm, there's also going to be a moment exerted around that point in that direction. Of 10 kips times 2 feet, there's an applied moment then of 20 kip feet. So we can replace that bracket arm with this kind of load at point C. Nice when you already know the answer, where to put the uh, axis. I know that it needs to be high, I've already done this. So I'll save you some erasing. We're going to have nothing but negative shear and negative moment on this problem. We don't know that normally going in, but I happen to know it, so I'll save you a little trouble when you're dry on your graph so your notes aren't so messy. So we'll make a cut somewhere between A and B. Some distance x out from the end. 
we need to do it our cut somewhere between A and B. That's that's where uh, we that's how far we can go before things change. We have a uniform load till there. Uh, after that, the uniform load stops, so we'll have to redo it after B. Oh, you need to have found the reactions, I hope. Maybe we should do that. To, well, I'll put it in real quick. We can double check it. Thirty-four kip, and it also supplies a moment of three hundred and eighteen kip feet. some amount and there's moment that way we must have moment back the other way so we already know that's going to be negative shear is going to be negative just the way uh, we can tell from what we've already got loaded how much shear must we have at this little exposed piece right here Remember, it's, a, it's an artificial cut we've done there. We're looking for the internal forces. We have a uniform load of three kips per foot for X feet. So that'll be three kip, and it's negative in there. Oh, sorry, three X. Stephanie, you gotta try it now. Uh, easiest way to make it is just 3x chips. It's negative. Our convention says that we make it negative at x equals 0. And then it's linear with a slope of minus 3. Up on that end is our negative convention. So it goes to a maximum of Minus 24 kips. How do we figure out the moment? Well, The area is 3x. We replace that with a single point load then of 3x. Since there are no other vertical loads, of course, that's equal to the shear. And so the moment is that load times that moment arm. So the load is 3x. And it's a distance x over 2 away. Change in moment 
should be the same as the area under here, which is one half times the base eight times the height 24 is 96. So that made sense. Again, the area here is equal to the change in moment between the same two sections. All right, we'll uh, we'll finish that up Monday. And we'll, we'll do some more because we need to get these right. Uh, again, what we're looking for is the maximum shear, the maximum moment, and where they occur so we can start designing the cross section of the beams and choose the material to withstand those loads at those internal points.